Okay, we're back. We have Mel Davis. Mel, thank you for coming on. Would yeah. you mind just giving a, a brief intro on yourself and kind of currently what you're doing? Sure. Yeah. So my background is in neuroscience, but I was super into jujitsu throughout my graduate career. So after graduate school, I kind of wanted to marry my passion for science, my passion for sport. And I happen to know Dr. Michael Isertel, um, started getting involved with Renaissance periodization. So now I do coaching, writing, editing, um, course design kind of stuff for them and sort of put my, my science and my sport hobbies into one place for a career. So your PhD is in neurobiology and behavior. How did you, what did that path look like? How'd you even become interested in that field? Yeah. <laughs> So I kind of bumbled around college for a long time. No one really explained to me that it was like a purpose-driven <laughs> endeavor. So I was like, I want to study Japanese. I want to study poetry. I want to study Spanish. And then eventually the university was like, you have to graduate. You can't be here any longer. And I was like, oh, I have to choose something. Um, so I, for just luck of the draw, kind of have signed up for a neuroscience cl class to fill some biology, you know, requirement for whatever I had decided I was doing at the moment. And it was just kind of the most fascinating thing I'd ever read about or ever done. Studying for it wasn't work. I, I looked forward to studying for it. And I kind of thought, you know, maybe this, maybe this is a good idea. Did you initially want to stay in academia and publish research or what was the plan after the PhD? Yeah, that, that was my plan. I, I really enjoyed um, scientific research. I really liked writing, you know, experiment plans. I like carrying them out. I love the fun of like setting up the data analysis and like, ooh, is my hypothesis right? You know, waiting for the outcome. Um, but I realized the further you go in academia, the less of that you get to do and the more you write grants and stress about money. Um, and the hours were long and I just I had the opportunity with Renaissance periodization. It gave me a lot more flexibility and free time. And it was just kind of less stressful and more fun. And um, the teaching I got to do with the, just the general public with Renaissance Periodization too was just so much more rewarding. Um, college students, I don't know if you've ever taught them before, but they're just kind of arguing for points and you don't get to see a lot of the like excitement and drive for learning. Whereas people, adults who are just seeking it out are usually motivated and interested and you know appreciative when you help them. So that was kind of more fulfilling as well. Yeah. So the main topic for today will be on your area of expertise and what you work on the most behavior and behavior change. Can we start by defining what behavior is and then maybe differentiating it from what a habit or habits are? Yeah. So all habits are behaviors, not all behaviors are habits. Um, in defining behavior, if you're a scientist doing a study, behavior is anything an animal or person does that you can observe. But when you're talking about habit change, behavior includes internal thoughts because you can observe your own internal thoughts, right? So in the context of a person trying to change their habits or change their behavior, behavior is basically anything that they do in response to a stimulus. And a stimulus can be anything from a thought to a person, to a place, to a food. Um, anything that you can touch, see, smell, feel, or think. What actually drives someone's behavior? Yeah, so that's, that is complicated. There's a fields and fields of research dedicated to that. Um, there's a lot of things. There's uh, genetic components to why people have tendencies to do what they do. Um, things like grit. And uh, willpower seem to have a, a genetic component. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't foster them in people, but it does mean that some people, you know, just like some people are better at basketball than others. Um, there's going to be some people who have an easier time doing those things. Um, behaviors driven by, you know, social motivations, emotional motivations, physical motivations. Um, it's very complex and sort of depends on the specific behavior, I guess. And that probably uh, specificity of behavior it probably goes into this next question of how moldable are behaviors? And I'm assuming some are more malleable than others. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think 
we have some instinctive behaviors that are really hard to change at all. But a lot of those you probably don't want to, you know, pulling your hand away from something that looks like a snake is probably a, a wise instinctual behavior to have that maybe you shouldn't um, completely eliminate. Uh, other things, you know, like not going to the gym is something you might want to change. Um, so in terms of our day-to-day -day behavior and habits, they're very, very changeable, but it's hard work. So it does take effort, a great deal of effort to change your behavior, but it is possible. And the field of behavior change uh, and I guess habit change as well, how long has this area of research and study been around for? Oh, decades, decades. Yeah, they started, they started trying to figure out how they could change people as soon as they started, you know, studying behavior. Um, it's a kind of an interesting progression of thought, though. There was, there was a time at which it was believed that there was really no such thing as motivation or willpower, that everything was actually kind of, every behavior was a stimulus response. And if you didn't know what the stimulus was, you just didn't find it yet. Um, and I think that that finally changed at some point, but that for a long time sort of limited our, um, the field of study that could have helped people work on their habits and change their behavior. There's this sort of, um, there's a very narrow field of view. And if you went out of it, you were kind of a hippie and you got kind of put down in the scientific community. And then finally reality busted through, you know, motivations, emotions, these things all play a role in why people do what they do. And it's not always just a very simple stimulus response series that produces a behavior. So we evolved from thinking that we were kind of just like mice hitting the button for the cocaine shot into the idea that we're very complex creatures whose behaviors are driven by a variety of different things and are malleable and we, we can make a conscious effort to change them. So the, the thing we'll probably dive into the most for this episode will be on the process of behavior change in clinical practice or in a coaching setting. Most of the listeners, they're either clinicians or coaches or students going into either of those fields. So the process of working with an individual on behavior change, can you discuss kind of what that may look like? Um, yeah. from starting that initial discussion? Yeah. So I, I would say even before the, the behavior change attempts begin, behavior change can be kind of, it's a touchy thing. It's very personal stuff, right? So I think one of the most important things you do before you endeavor to help someone else with it is to develop kind of that coach, client, or clinician, patient rapport, mentor, mentee rapport, however you want to say it where you can effectively communicate with the person without making them feel sort of judged. So you want to enter into that relationship with the idea that it's a collaboration, wherein you have some expertise in behavior change strategy, but the person you're working with has expertise in themselves because behavior change is very individual. Some strategies work for some people, some don't. Um, so you need to sort of respect and foster their expertise in themselves and work together. So just to give a kind of more practical example and just a simple weight loss example, if you have the outcome goal of weight loss, right? You could have 10 different people that have 10 different behaviors that are getting in the way of their weight loss. So one person might need to walk more. One person might need to stop eating at McDonald's every weekend. Another person might need to stop drinking every night. There's like a variety of behaviors that can, could contribute to preventing the weight loss goal. And then when you get to each of those individual behaviors, there's a variety of strategies that work for different people to change that behavior. So not every strategy will work even for the same goal and same behavior problem. Um, so starting off that relationship with just really good communication, not assuming that you know everything, but that you have guidance to offer and that they also have information to give you to guide your helping them, if that makes sense. I'll stop monologuing, but we can go back into the behavior change process. I just don't want to talk nonstop. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So the let's say it's an initial conversation with a client that you're working with, or if you were to recommend how this may look for 
a clinician with working with patients or other coaches, that initial discussion, whether it's from a, they want to change their like behaviors or attitudes with eating or with movement or exercise or whatever it is, are there kind of certain questions or ways you frame that initial discussion with an, yeah, uh, with yeah, a, definitely. a client? Um, the way that I like to approach it is I have kind of an intake form and I ask them what they're, what are the outcome goals? Like, what are you hoping to achieve? And then have you tried to achieve this before? If so, what do you think got in your way the most? What do you see as your biggest obstacles? Um, you don't want to focus entirely on their negative behavior. So what do you see as your behaviors and habits that, that will be helpful in this endeavor? Um, and you kind of start there. And then um, and making sure you're asking them a lot of questions so they feel like they're involved in the process and giving their input. Um, that's sort of empowering to people and motivates them a little bit more. Um, once you kind of have an idea of what they think their uh, productive and unproductive behaviors are for their goal, you have them start kind of, this is the, the woo-woo sounding part of it, start kind of practicing mindfulness and awareness um, and tracking their behaviors because a lot of times habits are so automatic that we don't really put a lot of conscious thought into them. We're not noting them in the moment. And um, just the process of starting to try to be aware of what's happening when you're performing these unwanted or wanted behaviors can start sort of the process of change. But even more importantly, that sort of mindfulness and ability to monitor your behavior allows it allows you to change it, right? So if you were starting a diet, you wouldn't weigh yourself on day one and day 90 only. So the same with behavior change. You can't just check in on behavior on day one, make a plan to change it, not track what's happening or if you're improving and expect there to be a great result on day 90 or whatever it is. How do you balance that ability to regularly check in on the behavior versus like a neurotic uh, too much hyper analyzing yes. of this change. Yeah. So you try to keep it, um, you want them to observe their behavior in a non judgmental manner. So it's just a data collection. You don't want them perseverating and thinking about what they do wrong all the time. Just note how often, you know, like set your parameters. I want you to keep a log of how often it happens, how long it lasts, things like that. Um, across the week. And then typically when they start working on change, changes are subtle. You might not notice them if you're not monitoring, but the fact that they're monitoring and seeing the change sort of relieves the stress and relieves a tendency towards neuroticism about it when they start to see, you know, if you've ever worked with anyone trying to, you know, increase their total on lifting or lose some weight, they're most obsessive and most neurotic when things aren't changing and they feel like they don't have control. Once there's this evidence that the the strategies they're using are starting to work, even in a minute way, you you lose a little bit of that because you gain some self-efficacy and confidence that like, okay, I have the tools here to keep making this change. During that initial discussion with an individual, they map out what their hopes or goals are, what ending ideally would look like for them. Are there ever situations where in your head initially, it seems very unrealistic, whether it's the timeline, whether it's just the end goal itself, and do you ever redirect or alter some of those expectations or goals? Or is it is that kind of spread throughout the process? What does that look like? Yeah, I like to reset expectations from the beginning. Um, one of the worst things that can happen when someone's seeking to make any kind of change is that they fail in some way, because the minute you fail, you are losing self-efficacy, which predicts success. So you really want to foster as much of that self-efficacy, that feeling that they're capable as possible. So unrealistic goals are a really bad way to do that, right? So it's a, it's a gentle process, but you know, you provide them with the information about why that goal isn't realistic and what might be better and more sustainable and sort of what could happen if you try to train for your first marathon, lose 30 pounds of fat and gain 10 pounds of muscle in three months the first time you've ever started exercising. Like, 
what are the downsides of that? Because very often, in addition to these outcome and behavior goals, what a lot of people newer to that goal arena actually need are learning goals. So you can have them start working on um, understanding, right? When you've never run a marathon before, you have no idea what it takes. You have no idea what like suffering or caloric needs or pain and work that that entails. So it's very easy to overestimate what you can do when you haven't learned about the details of a process. So giving people um, learning goals when they're sort of in that super noob uh, arena or super noob level for their goal arena is a really good way to start. And often when you do that and you don't, you know, you're not shaming them for having an ambitious goal, you applaud them for the ambition and then say like, hey, you know what might be a better idea if you want to um, sustain your new habits and like keep the weight off or keep the progress going is to do it this way a little slower. It's actually really difficult to do it this quickly and so on. So, And these, like you'd mentioned that the reflection and the monitoring of the progress and their own thoughts of how things are going, when you have those check-ins with an individual and maybe they're not consistently hitting what you all both are hoping for, what that individual is hoping for. How do those conversations look? Is it reframing maybe what the standard of what they're trying to achieve is or what the current goal is? Or how do you go about it when there's consistently, they're not meeting movement towards the goal? Yeah, so often it's sort of an, an evolution with behavior change processes because you have, you know, you'll give them some strategies to use. Um, can see if I can think of a good example. So someone wants to walk more. Maybe um, the strategy that you give them is to use what's called temptation bundling. So they get on the treadmill and they watch their favorite show, but they're only allowed to watch the favorite show when they're on the treadmill. And like that's the the sort of behavior strategy you're using to try to get them on the treadmill more. And they find themselves just watching their favorite show without getting on the treadmill. And so that's not really working for them. So maybe you want to try, um, maybe the treadmill they go to is at the gym. So you're like, okay, maybe we need instead, temptation bundling isn't working. Maybe we need to just decrease the activation energy of your walk so you don't have to drive to the gym. How about you walk outside and, you know, make that phone call to your mom that you're supposed to make once a week and you aren't, you're forgetting to do, or, you know, listen to your favorite podcast and do the walk around your house and maybe decreasing activation energy is the thing that's going to work for you. Um, so you just kind of ask, see if you can get at, you know, why is this strategy not seem to be working? Like, yes, I want to watch my favorite show. The problem is I hate driving to the gym after work. It's a pain. There's traffic. You know, you, you get at what, um, what their pain points are and try to restructure the strategy to address those. Because the sort of the idea that you can just tell someone like, okay, you just got to do it is silly what you your goal is as their mentor in this process is to find the way that makes it the easiest as possible for them to do what they're supposed to do because that's going to be the most sustainable that's the most likely way that they'll end up building a habit that lasts and speaking of the mentor role or relationship how much do you go towards giving kind of very specific feedback or guidance or telling them what they should be doing versus having them explore what they think is the the way to go about these easiest changes or having them ultimately decide how much of it is like, well, they're seeking my advice and my expertise. How much do I directly tell them what they should be doing versus they need to ultimately kind of stumble through this? If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to sort of provide guidance, like your best guess and your best suggestion, but leave it open ended for them to make the decision. Um, telling them what to do, sort of having a drill sergeant approach is usually not as effective or productive in these situations, but nor is being completely passive and giving them, you know, complete freedom to make the choices. So what you want to do is say, you know, this, this, and this would probably be your best bets. If you're struggling with this, this is how you could adjust those a little to make it easier. What do you think? What do you think will be the biggest problem with this? Is there, do you see a way around it? And you sort of, that sort of collaborative spirit um, of taking their input combined with your expertise to figure out a plan that works for them. Like 
just another example, I've done tons of coaching for people for nutrition. And when I first started out, you know, I knew the optimal way to do it. You know, you're going to have six meals a day. You're going to structure your carbs around your training. You're going to have more fats at night. You're having protein every five hours. And I wanted to impose this optimal diet on everyone I worked with because it's the best. It'll work the best. It covers all your bases. You're hundred percent going to make the best possible progress. But it turns out the perfect diet isn't so perfect if someone can't follow it. And something that's 80% perfect that someone can follow 100% is going to get them way more results than if they just can't do it and they end up giving up and not trying again because now they think that's the only way and that they're incapable. Um, so I forgot what you asked, but um, basically rambling about <laughs> that sort of collaboration and trade offs that you make with. A, your client or your mentee um, such that you find a way that they can make progress, that they can adhere to the plan and sort of let go of your idea of optimal because a lot of us know exactly what that is and we want to give it to the person, but it's less helpful. What have you noticed with clients? What are the very common things that they'll say that's a maybe either an excuse or the reality of why they're not why there's friction or inertia with change what are the things that you commonly hear and that you have to address or work through yeah i think um another cool tool to use with people is reframing their statements to be actionable so a lot of people will say like i'm lazy i'm a fat kid at heart i just i'm not good at this i blank and it's one of those statements that puts them in a box and takes away their ability to change so you know something a statement like oh, i can't lose weight because there's always free food at my work and i i can't resist it so reframing that to be actionable would be something like i want to lose weight It's going to be more difficult for me because I have these daily temptations. So in order to reach my goal, I need to find a way to work around these temptations or avoid them. So just taking the I can't because and turning it into I can, but it's going to be hard and this is how how I'll do it um, can be super helpful for people because those statements, as silly as it sounds, those sort of boxing in statements really do mentally constrain us um, from making changes a lot of times. Um, I have a, I tell this story a lot, but it was like the perfect example of this to me. I was teaching a seminar in Canada and talking about some of this stuff. And this guy raised his hand and he was like, I used to say all the time, like he used to be overweight. I used to be, say, I'm, I'm just the happy fat guy. And he's like, I said this, so the people wouldn't feel sorry for me so that I could pretend to be proud of what I was. But inside, like, I didn't want to be fat, but I felt like I couldn't make a change because I had defined myself as the happy fat guy. And if I changed, people would look down on me. Um, And he said, when I finally broke out of that, like, it changed my life and fitness is really important to me now, like I'm healthier. Um, So these little things we say to ourselves can be super impactful. Yeah, that's very resonates strongly with the rehab side where a lot of people will self identify with having bad knees or a bad back and it really limits their participation in life and daily activities or exercise. And part of it is just their own, the unfortunate like narratives and beliefs that they've taken on from other healthcare interactions or through social Mm -hmm. media. But it's also, there's almost this, um, this quality that people enjoy of like, this is what I've identified with as a part of my body. And I want to. As soon as you make it a part of your identity, it's even harder to change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you hear from whether it's social media or from just other clients that they've been told with through other coaches or other interactions that are these big misconceptions from a behavior change or from this realm of habit change where you think we should just directly acknowledge aren't true or we should probably not do through this path yeah i have i have a couple of sort of pet peeve ones um one is kind of like the the smart goals 
strategy and that that sort of whole ethos. And it's it's not a bad one. It's just that those don't work for everyone. So the first letter in the acronym SMART is specific, right? You're supposed to choose a specific goal. Um, and for beginners, specific goals are kind of a bad idea. If you, you know, take it to the rehab realm, I just had ACL surgery about 11 months ago. I knew nothing about the rehab process for that. I knew nothing about what, if you had left me to make my specific goal, I would have been back at jujitsu in three months. Thank you very much. Um, but because I didn't have the requisite knowledge, that would be a ridiculous goal. So making a specific goal for someone who doesn't have any knowledge in the arena can be a really bad idea. And also like, as you and your audience probably know, like not everyone recovers at the same speed. It depends on where you started, um, what you did with your diet, how often you're doing your PT and all of those things. So even in the case where you have the therapist has the requisite knowledge, they still can't make a very specific outcome goal. So for some people in some cases, making a very broad outcome goal, like we will improve over time um, is a better idea. So I think the, the idea that one method of goal setting and behavior change is effective for people of all sort of levels is silly. Whereas you have, you know, different situations, someone who is an athlete, competitive athlete for 10 years, they can make a very specific goal for what their improvements across the next three months should be because they have so much knowledge and experience in that arena. And if they don't make a specific goal, they might not make progress. So for some people being very specific and very rigid is a great idea. For other people, it's devastating. So um, just sort of that, the conception that everyone should apply the same process is one of my pet peeves in the sort of popular culture realm of this topic. Um, the other is just the, the sort of willpower is the way kind of, you know, Jocko Willick uh, kind of attitude, like just grit your way through it. Just be hard, brother. You got this. Um, that attitude bothers me a lot, too, just because willpower is so fickle compared to habitual behavior. You need a little willpower to get through the process of building habits. It's hard work. But once you've built a habit, it is resistant to stress. In fact, people tend to, to perform more habitual behavior when they're stressed. So if you've built a bunch of productive habits and stress comes, you might be even more productive. Um, whereas if you're relying on willpower to do things and stress comes, you're screwed. It's everything's going to go downhill because willpower is very subject to stress. So those are those are my two main misconception pet peeves, I think. Yeah, my the clinic I work in in person, we have a lot of firefighters and there's a stereotype of um, these firefighters that really like the Jocko Wheeling, David Goggins yeah. <laughs> kind of like vibe. And there's this guy I'm thinking of in particular that's like, I just crushed David Goggins, book, David Goggins book and I'm just ready to, he wanted to make a change. And then next yeah. week, like he hasn't done anything. So it's just this fleeting right. thing that doesn't really change the fact that he has like three or four kids and that he has like right. life. It's just, it's yeah. So yeah. is there any other misconceptions or things that you want to address before we jump to the um, next yeah. I think another, another thing that just brought to mind is like, when and where you decide on your goals. So, you know, if you're chilling on the couch, drinking a glass of wine, you're probably feeling like you could achieve all kinds of stuff in terms of your workout. Um, if you're in the middle of an excruciating squat day or you're, you know, like initial PT after surgery, things like that, and you think about what kind of goals you want to make for how often you want to suffer like this, your goals will probably be a little different. So. It can be a really good idea to sort of get started on something. And when you're suffering through some of the work of it, then set your outcome goals because you tend to be a little more realistic when you're suffering than when you're very comfortable and motivated and just read a book about someone. By the way, they have a great new series of memes um, for both of those guys. And it'll just be a picture of them. And it'll be like, stab yourself in the face you know like be a man um that are just like outlandish and super funny yeah every time oh it's it's like a bingo 
or like you know which type of personality is the person going to bring up is it going to be like the it knees over toes guy like they really just want to start pushing sleds are they going to talk about david goggins are they going to bring up jocko willing it's just like it's a circular six or so males that they always chat about yeah, and I don't yeah. like dog any of them, but it's just it's comical how frequently those individuals are yeah. uh, discussed. Yeah. What maybe I should have asked this earlier on, but what actually needs to occur for if we're going through this process, what actually needs to occur for these new behaviors to stick and last? Yeah, so mostly for habits, it's repetition. Um, just doing them over and over a couple of tricks that kind of make habit formation a little faster are one, um, attaching the habit to an existing habit. So if you're just like, oh, I I need to start going to the gym on Saturdays, I'm going to pick two o'clock. That's going to become habit a lot less quickly and less likely to become habit. If you say, compared to saying something like, I'm going to go to the gym right after x existing thing that i all always do every saturday never miss like if it's you know i go visit my mom on saturdays i'm gonna go to the gym right after that or i have my son's little league practice i'm gonna go to the gym right after that so if you can tie the new behavior to something you're already automatically doing it becomes habitual much more quickly um tying your reason for doing the behavior to a personal value can also make it happen more quickly if you're just like, I'm going to the gym to so that when I see my ex, they, they think I look good and they feel sad they lost me. That's probably not going to be quite as sustainably motivating as I'm going to the gym because I want to stay healthy and be around and active for my kids or something more tied to a, a personal value rather than an external reward. That's not to say that external rewards are bad or not useful but they don't tend to be as sustaining as an internal value tied sort of motivation. Are there ever periods of time or situations where a client brings up something that they're highly interested in pursuing, whether it's a specific diet and they're all set on going, whatever it is, vegan, carnivore, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, And maybe initially you think they shouldn't do it, but are there periods where you allow them to try it and benefit from maybe like a failure process or them kind of realizing their own on their own that maybe this isn't the most productive long term strategy? Yeah. So generally things like that, um, if someone comes to me and they say, I really want to switch to a vegan diet, I'll, you know, be interested, say, oh, okay, why are you interested in what got you interested in that? What are your motivations? Just see sort of what what they're thinking. If they're like, you know, I watched Game Changers and it said that it's really healthy and it makes you a better athlete and it's really good, then, you know, you provide some information without judgment. So something like, yeah, so adding lots of fruits and vegetables to your diet is one of the most healthy things you can do. But it's actually that aspect of veganism that's healthy rather than the elimination of meat. Um, But if you still want to try it, we can work on that and make sure you get enough protein. Um, But it's really not mandatory for the results you want. Like here are the aspects of it that are important, eating fresh fruits and vegetables on a regular basis, getting enough fiber and so on. And then sometimes when they realize that that restraint isn't required for the outcome they want, they'll just let it go. Um, Other times, you know, maybe they want to be vegan because animals dying makes them sad. And that's a totally different thing. That's a personal value. So you really don't want to take that away from them and tell them they have to eat meat to be healthy because then they're torn between a personal value and a goal. And that's not very productive. So getting at understanding why they're doing something, giving them a little bit of information so they can make a decision. And then, you know, whatever the decision is, just sort of helping them to the best of your ability within that. What about the type of client where there's always this like moving target, they can never stabilize a goal. And it's maybe there you you all agreed on this being a realistic thing that we're going to move towards and we're moving in the right direction. But then two weeks in or a month in, they completely just like change paths. I'm sure that (laughs) that happens frequently. How do you maybe redirect or discuss uh, the changing in goals? And are there periods where you're like, oh, well, let's actually like shift towards this other floating moving target? 
Yeah. Yeah. So I kind of, that's my, my periodization lecture. I try not to make it sound like a lecture, but just talking to people about like, oh, okay, you're interested in that too. Like that thing and this thing, we can't really do at the same time effectively. Do you want to finish this thing first? And then we'll move on to that as our next plan and like our periodization of your improvement. Um, and yeah, some people are just, there's some people who are going to want to jump goals all the time. And as long as they feel like they're making progress and they're happy, you know, I, I suppose it depends on the arena, you know, if it's in something like physical therapy or, you know, trying to get to a point of movement capability, that might be a really bad thing. But if it's just like, oh, I want to get really strong. Well, now I want to lose some fat. Well, now I want to do this. And they're happy making those quick changes and making little bits of progress in each arena. Like, let them do it. Let them be happy if that's what they enjoy. But if they're sort of defeating themselves, then it's time to sit down and have that sort of periodization talk. Like, in order to make real progress, we need to get through this one goal first, and then we can absolutely tag that one on to your next mesocycle or phase or whatever it is. What does it look like towards the end of a interaction or relationship with a client? They're coming towards the end of their um, time with you. And how do you set them up for, okay, maybe we work towards and accomplish this thing. Is there anything long-term that you're discussing or what is the, the, yeah, the final period yeah, of time with someone of look like? Um... In my mm -hmm. experience, a lot of people, by the time they're like, okay, I don't need coaching anymore, they have sort of developed some really good habits, the ability to build their own habits, the ability to sort of help themselves with all the things that I was helping them with. And I think the the best thing you can do to set people off for that like happy offboarding is to be giving them information throughout the process of coaching and helping them understand sort of why you're having them do what you're doing. You're going to have some people who don't care. They want guidance forever. They don't want to understand. They want someone to tell them what to do. But for the most part, if you explain to people like, oh, let's try this and this is why, um, they collect that information over time and integrate it and are able to use it. And the offboarding is just kind of like, if you panic, shoot me an email. And I'll, you know, talk you through it, but you, I'm pretty confident that you're capable of handling this on your own now. You had mentioned early on, you maybe had this idealistic view of what you wanted everyone to accomplish or what you would say to individuals. What other things have changed throughout your career interacting with clients of, I used to do this and maybe I cringe thinking that I used to do this. And yeah, what examples or things have you? evolved and, and changed throughout your practice yeah definitely um that one and sort of communication strategies not not imposing my ideas of what's best on other people and really listening to what their values and and limitations and things are um not assuming that they can can and want to do it exactly the way that i would or exactly the optimal way um being more gentle when they have sort of unfounded or unscientific beliefs or things that they're doing. Um, you know, I used to, if clients would come to me and say they're seeing like a naturopathic doctor who diagnosed them with like liver toxins that aren't moving and, you know, like a chakra block or something. I used to be like, the tendency was to be like, that's not real. It's not scientific. Don't go to them anymore. But now I have to, you have to respect placebo, right? Like, when people believe things, things can happen. And if there's no harm coming to them from doing whatever silly thing they're doing and they get either stress relief or relaxation or um, interaction with people, they might be getting all kinds of other little positive things from it that are actually helpful to them. So being less judgmental of those things, um, providing information when needed, you know, if they're doing something, maybe they're spending a lot of money or it's not necessarily good for them providing a little gentle information so that they can make a decision themselves but not sort of putting down um the things that they believe in has been i think really helpful i think it builds better rapport and 
you just have to look back on your own life. Like, have I believed ridiculous things in my life? Sure. Did they help me in some cases? Probably. And that's okay. Um, so not trying to turn every client into a scientist, I think is, is also a, something that's been important. Um, focusing for me a lot more on the behavior change, because initially I was just a coach for nutrition and training. It was like, here's the stuff, do it. And then people sometimes wouldn't do it. And I was like, what's the answer? Do it. Just, you need to do it. You know, and at some point I realized like they know they need to do it. What they don't know is how to make themselves do it. And if I can find a way to help them with that aspect, then we can get somewhere. So just integrating, you know, like this isn't just I send you macros and lifts and you do them. Like I send you macros and lifts. I ask you about your life. I ask you when you're more hungry, when you're less hungry, what you struggle with. And we work through those obstacles and find an, an individ, individualized plan that fits your lifestyle preferences, limitations, um, and we work on the behaviors that are getting in your way and we foster the ones that are helping you until we've got you doing what you're supposed to do with less effort. Do you, going back to the, the goals and the behaviors themselves throughout the process and right at the beginning, are you actually having people write down the things that they want to accomplish and is mm -hmm. everything like within a document or within on paper and is that tracked over time as opposed to kind of this floating goal yeah 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 it depends it depends on the client and what they're working on me with i have some clients who are doing exclusively behavior change without any you know diet or training or whatever it is um and yeah then we have a lot more of the goal and behavior and personal values kind of documents that we're working on and behavior tracking documents um Whereas sometimes for like a diet or training client, it'll be most of the documents are faced are focused on their diet and training. And we just kind of talk about the behaviors and have them track them a little more qualitatively. With those clients, maybe that are purely behavior change or any of the others, I'm sure there's this, there can be a very close um, territory bleeding into like referral to a psychologist and things are brought up of why certain behaviors aren't changed. Do you have any ideas or recommendations on, okay, I'm hearing this, this is uh, beyond my scope. How do yeah, you go yeah. about that process? Yeah, absolutely. I think that tends to come up a lot, particularly in diet, um, because you'll start to see some patterns that are disordered enough that I'm like, I am, I'm not an eating disorder specialist. I'm not a psychologist. Um, I have a big background in psychology, but I'm not qualified to help you if you have, you know, an eating disorder or some like very disordered eating patterns or um, any other sort of psychological issues that are outside of the realm of just normal behavior change. So definitely I look for uh, the red flags in terms of dieting are, you know, just extreme fixation on food, the inability to um, run a maintenance phase and increase calories, um, expressions of like wanting, not wanting to live if they can't lose weight, like you can get some pretty extreme stuff. And if you see a couple of those red flags in, you know, your intake form, I usually probe a little bit more about that. And if I feel like they're on a level that I can't, be of help and shouldn't be helping them, um, then I'll recommend very gently that they see someone more qualified in that arena. And I've done that a few times. Going back to the maybe evolution throughout your career, early on, was there more of a tie towards like your investment in their outcomes? And when clients wouldn't achieve what they were looking for, you felt like you were also at loss? Because I I'm asking because I feel this a lot with my own patients in clinic of I'm trying to detach myself from the the reality of people just there's going to be periods where they're not going to meet the metrics that I'm looking for, yeah. whatever the factors are. But it's really hard for me to like not think about that and ruminate on it a lot. Have you, has that evolved throughout your career? I wish I had advice on that. I'm terrible. Uh, that I, I have so much invested in how my clients are doing. And I, yeah, I do. It's probably not a healthy, healthy way to be. Um, I mean, granted, there's obviously a benefit to being invested in your clients and caring deeply about their success. 
but yeah, it also can wear on you um, when you're taking, you know, each hit of multiple different people's failures as your own. That's a lot to carry. Um, yeah, I don't have great advice other than keeping the perspective that like some people just aren't ready to change and they might they might be in that sort of contemplation phase when they come to you where they're thinking about it, but they're not ready to act. And then unfortunately you you get to be the person that they fail with before they later, you know, move from contemplation to action and actually um get something done. But yeah, I think I think there's no way around it. And I think everyone who works with people in any capacity deals with this, you know, from like doctors to firefighters to therapists to diet coaches. Um it's a tough thing because you you tend to do a job like this, at least partly because you care. So turning that off is, is complex. Is there anything in the, the broader realm of behavior change literature uh, or within your own, uh, you know, experience that you're currently rethinking or that this uh, broad field is going through change with the either currently or within the past few years, there's been some significant shifts. Um, I don't think there's been any real significant shifts in terms of behavior change research in recent years. Um, I think we're kind of in a good place with that research. We've in the last probably 20 years sort of, um, gotten rid of a bunch of sort of Zeke guys that were there for a long time. And I think that the current state of the research and understanding is super solid. Um, some of the stuff persists like, uh, um, I don't know if you probably heard about this one's popular, popular culture kind of science experiment from 20, 30 years ago. Uh, they took children and gave them a marshmallow and told them, you know, if you wait, you get two marshmallows. And then they uh, assessed how long the kids waited to eat the marshmallow when they left the room. And then they checked out their lives down the line. And they were like, oh, if you have willpower as a child, you're going to be super successful. But um, they sort of failed to look at a bunch of other variables there. And so what the truth of it was when they the study was kind of redone and more variables were assessed was that the children in the study who came from a sort of... Um, background of less stability so like a household poverty household and poverty parents with on and off jobs um, just sort of insecurity in terms of their life and food and things like that their effective strategy that they learned was you take the good thing now because it might not be there later and um so it turns out that what was actually predictive of their success was their background and the marshmallow eating was just kind of a side effect of that. And when you parsed out the different backgrounds of the kids and you looked at just, you know, the poverty group or the like super stable rich kids group um, in terms of how fast they ate the marshmallow within those groups did not predict their success. So the marshmallow had nothing to do with it and the background had everything to do with it. So there's a lot of things like that that hung around for a long time just because it's kind of a sexy story that's easy to understand. Um, but thankfully, people got curious, we did experiments, looked at other variables, and we kind of have an, a better understanding of how how complex willpower is. The other sort of the one that was around for a long time was that willpower is this thing that gets depleted like a gas tank. Like you have a reserve of willpower and you run out. And it turns out that willpower actually functions a lot more like an emotion, like you can be suddenly very sad and suddenly very happy and suddenly not so happy anymore. And it just sort of ebbs and flows in response to various stimuli in your life. So it's it's not this depletable resource that you can run out of um, for better or for worse. Right. But I think our, our current understandings are are pretty solid and actionable which is good. That's not to say that we won't learn more or the field won't expand, but I think we're in a good place where there's less myths, more truths, and a lot of actionable information out there. To the, the marshmallow experiment, the kids that have more stability and more resources, do you notice that within this current realm of online 
coaching or fitness where ultimately the people that are seeking out services have the time and money and readiness to invest compared to these populations and individuals that aren't going to have time to seek out help remotely and pay $200 for coaching or whatever it is. Yeah. How do you, do you have any ideas for people, coaches, clinicians, providers that work in lower income cities or, or regions or areas where they are limited compared to some individuals seeking remote help? Yeah. So I think one interesting thing that sort of comes about is that there's this kind of sweet spot where when you pay that much money for something and it's like, ooh, it hurts a little. And it's an investment where people work the hardest. Um, whereas people who have tons of money and they throw a couple hundred at a coach for a diet, they don't really feel like they've lost anything if they fail because that money wasn't worth that much to them. Um, when I first started, I, I coached a lot of friends and family and I was like, what's wrong with my friends and family? Like everyone I'm coaching for free sucks. What is the problem? And I, I was like, oh, I think it's a motivation thing. Like, why would you like you didn't pay? So why are you invested? So I started um, saying these are my usual rates, friend or family. I'll coach you for free, but if you fail, you have to pay me the going rate. And that actually ended up making people a lot more successful because there was something kind of riding on it. So I think there's some interesting stuff that goes on there in terms of um, lower income areas where you're helping people. I think that's an especially important time to sort of educate them on the process and the delayed gratification aspect of it. Um, thinking about things that way might not come as naturally on average to people. I don't want to classify anyone in any arena because you really can't, but like it might not come as naturally on average to people um, working pay paycheck to paycheck to think about delayed gratification with respect to, you know, improving movement or lifting or whatever they're doing. Um, oh, I'm back. Okay. Video cut out for a second. Um, so I think that's an especially important arena to educate people like, None of this stuff happens overnight. It takes a long time. Here are the challenges you're going to face, like set up expectations for them from the beginning, because their expectations might be wildly off, might be even more likely to be wildly off. Do you have recommendations for resources and further areas of learning for clinicians, coaches, individuals that are more interested? where would you recommend people seek more help and information? Well, I'm super biased, but I have a book on the topic. So that's definitely one place you can look. Um, the book basically, it goes through a little background, the history of the, the research and stuff. And then it sort of talks you through the process from like intake to um, goal assessment to behavior change. And it goes through tons and tons of like individual behavior change strategies you can utilize and has um, some worksheets and different things you can use with yourself or other people. So I like to think it's pretty practically, practically applicable. Um, those words never come out right. The practical application is easy. That's a better way to say it. Um, and that book, What's the is, book called? it's called evidence-based habit building. It's on um, both the RP website and on Amazon. Usually if you search evidence-based habit building and add Renaissance or something, it'll pull it up faster just because there's a lot of, a lot of resources on the topic. Um, I haven't, I've only read bits of some of the other habit books out there. I didn't, as I was writing my book, that's kind of when those were coming out and were big and I didn't want to influence myself with other people's ideas. So unfortunately, I don't have a lot of recommendations um, outside of there. And a lot of the resources I used were scientific papers and other like very dry, dull, boring books on behavior that I wouldn't impose on anyone because it was awful reading them. Um, but yeah, I think that book i've i've heard good things about atomic habits i haven't read it um seems to be a practically i'm not going to do it it's applicable in a practical manner manner um yeah great well we'll, we'll link your book 
and awesome. the the summary from this episode what would you like individuals to leave with like if you could instill a few things of okay if you just took away xyz from this and started utilizing it with patients or clients do you have any big final thoughts or recommendations yeah let me do since we haven't done a lot of like how to um we've talked a lot more about theory i'll just do like a quick sort of summary of what i think uh the way i think that habit change works so um if we have a couple minutes if you don't mind i'll monologue for just a second um so basically a habit consists of a a stimulus or a context or a trigger and then an automatic behavior that follows. And there's not conscious thought really between um, that stimulus and that response. So super simple example, you see red light, your foot hits the brake. You don't have to think about it. You could be singing a song, yelling at your kid on a meeting on your phone, if you're in a state where it's legal talking to your phone in the car. Anyway, you get the idea. Stimulus, red light, response, foot hits the brake. You don't have to think about it. It happens automatically. And that's the case with a bunch of stuff that you don't want to do as well. Um, so there's sort of three targets for changing a behavior, and they're chronological. Changing the context, the trigger, the stimulus, changing the lack of consciousness between the stimulus and the response, and working on the response, the behavior, the outcome afterwards. So you can start helping people target their triggers for their unwanted behaviors by, you know, manipulating where they are, what they're doing, if they go out with their friend Paul on Friday night and he always like triggers an interest in drinking and eating French fries and they're trying to limit that. Maybe they go on a hike with Paul instead. So they're changing the context um, in terms of changing that lack of consciousness, that automaticity between the stimulus and the response. You can start working on strategies for being more aware. So that's where that mindfulness and awareness comes in because if you have a moment to make a conscious decision, you'll also often make a different one. So if you start being aware and you know you have a habit and you know what the trigger is, when you encounter the trigger, you can say, I'm going to wait five minutes before I do what I want to do, which is eat this donut or whatever it is. Um, food's just a really, really easy example. That's why I keep using those. Um, I'm going to take five minutes and think about this. Very often, those five minutes of conscious thought will alter what you're going to do because you're going to do it because it's an automatic habit, not necessarily because you want it or need it to. So getting that pause between stimulus and response um, can make a big difference. And then altering how it's rewarded. So, you know, what what are the things that make this really easy to do? What are the things that make this rewarding to do? And how can I replace that behavior with something that gives me that ease and that reward, but is more productive for my life. So just in general, picking apart these habitual behaviors that we don't want and targeting those three spots to try to change them. Um, and similarly with building a habit, you're sort of targeting, how can I make a context that makes me automatically do this thing? And how can I make it rewarding to do this thing so that I'll keep repeating it until it's habitual? So just wanted to get a little little application of all of this theory in there before we go. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you for adding that. Any other final thoughts before we call it? Um, be easy on yourself. Be, be gentle with people. Be, um, be patient because this stuff, it's, it's not Goggins. It's not overnight. It's not bully way through it. It's a lot of work and trial and error um, like anything else, but it, it pays off once you build the habit because then everything gets easier. Perfect. We'll call it there. Thank you so much, Mel. Yeah.